Thank you, Elliot. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, CIC. Thank you for coming. Um, this is my talk, Animating with Code. Uh, this was just, I felt the need to be cute. Um, yeah, and that's me. Here we go. Uh, so this is what the talk is going to be. Uh, first, we're going to have a little introduction. That's where you are now. Uh, then I'm going to talk about what I'm going to talk about. Um, and that's actually, you might suspect that that's going to be the bulky part of the talk, but it's not. It's kind of just an intro. Um, and then I'm going to talk about why you might want to do this thing that I'm telling you about in step number two. And then this is the part that probably will have the meat. Uh, I'm going to show you how I do the thing that I'm telling you why you should do it. That makes sense. Uh, and then I'm going to have some resources for you, some links, some ideas, etc. And then uh, some time for questions and answers. Um, so here we are, like I said, the intro. Uh, this is me, uh, and I know this is really more as part of the talk. Um, so I'm going to go fast. I'm a programmer, uh, which means I write code mostly. Uh, but I've gone into programming maybe in a sort of different way. Um, I like programming because of its sort of infinite creative potential, right? Like, I'm not a big fan of like data structures or anything. Like, I like making creative, fun, interesting things, and I like programming because of it. And that you'll see that in the talk I'm about to give. Uh, this. Uh, so I don't know if anyone remembers when Flash was owned by Macromedia. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. Um, back in the days when Internet Explorer was the good browser. Right. Um, and this book I got when I was I don't know in high school maybe and really was formative for why I like programming and why like most of this talk is in some way inspired by this and me getting this book 15 years ago. Um, and then if you still don't believe me that I'm creative, this is me at a prom in a duct tape suit that I made. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, I don't recommend it, it was very sweaty and yeah, that. All right, uh, so uh, I work for a wonderful company in Boston called Fable Vision Studios. These are my coworkers. Uh, some of my other coworkers are here. Uh, yeah, um, they're shy. Uh, yeah, and what we do is mission-based media. Um, so that's that's kind of a broad term. Um, what that means for me is educational software, uh, a lot of games, right? And that's going to be sort of important. I'm going to talk a lot about that in the why section about why I end up doing a lot of this stuff, um, and it's because I work in educational software. Um, and then about this presentation, uh, so I have a bunch of code that I'm going to show you. It's mostly pseudo code, like don't fact check it. There's probably a <laughs> simple. It's more to give you an idea, right? So don't copy and paste anything I show you. Just just to give you an idea. Uh, it's sort of in the beginner intermediate range, depending on, on who you are or what your interests are. Um, Ask questions. If, you, if I'm not being clear about something, if you're interested, if you want something more, just raise your hand. Also, if you ever can't hear me, just like do one of these. Does that mean everyone can, can you hear me? Yeah. Nice. Um, <laughs> flash photography is fine. I'm not that photogenic, though, so it's <laughs> All right. We're through the intro. Remember? Yeah, nice. OK. So here we go. This is what I'm going to talk about. Um, so when I was, uh, when Elliot asked me to give this talk, um, I thought really like I, knew, I thought I knew what I was going to talk about, um, but I sat under a waterfall and meditated, and I realized that like what I'm really talking about is not maybe what you might expect. Um, maybe it is though. I don't know. Uh, at the highest level, like sort of in the most extreme part of my meditation. This is what I came up with, right? We're really just visualizing some stuff over time, right? That's kind of it. And if I had called my talk this, you wouldn't be here right now. So I kept it animating with code. Um, but this is really, really what we're talking about. And I'm hopefully going to make that clear. Um, and just another way of saying that thing, right, is some visualization is equal to some state over some amount of time, right? Uh, and this is going to get weird um, before it gets understandable. So some visualization is equal to state 1 over state t, right? Because time is just another state. Um, and you take it another step further, right? Your visualization is really just another state. And, and this might sound dumb, but it will make sense because of how I end up doing things. 
what really interests some states, right? State A is equal to state B, and when you do that, you get really interesting things, right? And so here's an example. Um, I want you to think about this, right? Uh, so if you're not a programmer or if you're not super familiar with Unity, basically what I'm doing is I'm saying the rotation of some object, imagine this in 2D, is equal to its y velocity, so its speed up and down. What, what do you think would happen if we did this? I'm not, I just want you to think about that, right? And then, and, I, and I'll, I'll give you an answer later. And then this is sort of the important step, right, is that we're going to modify the velocity based on some other state, right? And interesting things will happen because of this. Are you thinking about what it, it might be? Okay, so as I was telling people what this talk was going to be about, everyone was like, oh, so you're going to talk about tweens, right? And I was like, well, not really. Um, and they're like, oh, you can talk about like skeletal animation. And I was like, well, not really. But everybody had that, so I was like, okay, well, it's pretty important. So I, I'm also going to talk about tweens. <laughs> um, this is really easing, but tweens a little bit, uh, just to so you know about them. Um, and I haven't talked about skeletal character animation. But those are sort of high level, right? Those are sort of, like if you took my core idea of that I had in the waterfall and you sort of package them, eventually you get here, right? But I'm, I'm thinking way smaller than that. Um, but we will talk about this stuff. Great. All right. So why do you want to do this? Um, I work at a place with a bunch of animators. Um, Fable Vision has a bunch of really great animators. Hannah's one of them, she's really talented. Um, so why wouldn't I just say, like, Hannah, make me a really nice animator? This is like number one for me. This is, uh, this is really important. Um, so let's say Hannah was gonna give me a character animation and it's sort of a traditional frame-based uh, sprite-based, frame-based animation. Um, and I wanted it to be a little different. I wanted to be bigger for some reason. This will make more sense in a little bit. Um, I would have to have her make me a new animation. Um, but when you're doing stuff with code, you can just change a number value. Um, and that's really important. Uh, flexible. So sort of along the same lines. Um, it's more flexible. Uh, it can solve more problems. Uh, it can adapt. Um, and again, I, I'm kind of going over this quickly because I want to get to the important stuff. Uh, but this is going to come up. Uh, and it's combinable. I don't know if this is the right word. Um, but you can, you know, who here has animated some, an idle loop with a blink animation? Is anyone? Yeah. Um, and have you ever had a bunch of those characters on screen at once? Sometimes they all blink in unison and it's super creepy and you don't realize it's going to happen. Um, but if you do something where you have like a walk animation and then you have blink animation, you can combine them and you can play them separately in a more organic way because nobody's like blinking at the same part of, right? Um, so this is really handy. Um, and we'll talk about that with character animation, but we'll also talk about it with this sort of weird abstract animation. Uh, and juice again, because it's really important. Uh, and then finally, this one's important for me: uh, making programmer art less terrible. Uh, so I, you know, I have a lot of projects, and I don't always have artists that want to help me with those projects. Um, and I end up with a lot of white squares or white cubes. Um, and one way to make that palatable and still feel like a game is with the stuff I'm going to talk about. It's easy. Um, honestly, I'm, I'm going to try and show you that there's a million ways to do what I'm talking about. Um, I'm showing you some of the ways that I use a lot, but they're all pretty easy, and in my opinion, they go a long way. Um, so if you're not doing it, you're just kind of being lazy. So do it. It's easy. Flying through this. All right, so I introduced myself, the company I work for. I told you what I was going to talk about, which is animating with code. I told you why you should do it. Uh, and now we're going to talk about how you can do it. Right? Um, any questions so far? Okay. 
All right, so remember that equation and then that example. So this is what happened, right? Um, so all I'm doing, I'm setting the rotation. You can ignore the Z, right, in the 2D world, but and I'm setting it equal to the velocity. So as it's going up, it's going to rotate to look up. As it's going down, it's going to rotate to look down. Right? Pretty simple. Um, and I don't show another example of this, but like, what's nice about this, let's say this square um, was going to shoot its stuff. Um, and you know, depending on the way that it was pointed, um, you know, is going to be your aiming, right? And so there could be some fun game where you have to use your velocity to, to shoot, right? So if you multiplied it by the agility or something, you can make a really diverse set of characters just by changing some numbers, right? And you couldn't really do that if this was sort of baked in to the animation itself. Uh, so that's that flexible and dynamic. Right, so that's a really, really simple example. Um, and, and what I'm going to go through is really just a collection of examples. Um, they're going to be simple, and I'll build a little bit, but we're not going to build to some huge thing at the end. Um, yeah. So another thing that's really important to regular animation is this idea of squash and stretch. Uh, it might be a little hard to see, um, but this little white guy, um, he's kind of got like a jelly feel. And it's sort of a similar thing, right? The scale, the Y scale, is equal to its, its sort of normal scale plus its velocity. And then its X scale is equal to its X scale minus its velocity. So if it's going up or down, and I suppose this should probably be an absolute value. Uh, you can kind of just ignore that. But if it's going up and down, it's going to be tall and skinny. And if it's just sort of normal, it's going to be short and fat, right? Two lines adds a ton of character to a white square. Um, so those are sort of like the lowest level ideas. You should do like do these things. Do these things. Like it's two lines of code. Do them, and your thing will feel better. <laughs> also, if you, if you want to fund this game, talk to me after. <laughs> okay. Uh, so sine and cosine. Um, I use these all the time. They maybe, it might feel like this is going to be intimidating, but it's not. It's really, it's, don't worry about the details really. Um, Unity has these functions, and basically what it's saying is like, make a sine wave, right? Like we know sine will create a wave. If you, if you graphed the sine function, it would, it would be a wave, right? And that's what's happening here. It's just happening over time, right? Animating with code, state you know, time. Um, and this is what you get. This one is actually cosine, um, and this one is sine, right? And just notice that it's an offset. Um, and, and that's a little boring, but, you know, if you if you were like, okay, oh, oops. So if we instead said, okay, the cosines can be x, right? Change, you know, set the x value equal to the cosine and set the y value equal to the sine, right? Still not that exciting. Uh, but if you put them together in one, you'll see why these are triangles in a second. Um, in one object, it's now moving in a circle, right? That's great. Uh, I don't know who played Zelda way back in the day, the first Zelda, yeah. probably a lot of people. There's a very important monster, I think, that is really just a collection of things moving in, in circles around it. And there's probably a ton of old NES games that had stuff moving in circles, and it's because it's really easy to do. So like do this, add particles, add special effects, your shield could be this thing. It's really easy to do, do it. I use this all the time. All right, and then, so again, back to the sort of flexible and dynamic thing, just by multiplying some value by two, it's not going to do this figure eight thing. Right, so dynamic, flexible, great. Kind of not that exciting, but you can do a lot with this. Any patterns, <coughs> all that kind of stuff. So essentially, you just changed your code to essentially multiply the collapse time by two. That's it. Uh, yeah, and yeah, okay. So what's happening, right, is elapsed time. Um, this is some value, but it's like your application starts and it's counting up how long. Right, um, how long it's been since the thing started. And 
I know you all know this is like a GIF, right? But in reality, this is actually what happens uh, because of the way cosine and sine work is they just repeat, right? Over and over and over again. So as elapsed time gets bigger, this will happen. Um, and that's just because of how sine and cosine work. Uh, they're very important functions. You don't necessarily need to know the nitty gritty. This is what happens. You get waves. And yeah. Um, and so because, so like essentially what we're doing is we're saying that it should sort of move along the, the cosine way twice as fast, right? So it's going to kind of go twice as fast. It's going to go back and forth twice while it goes up once. And that gives you like a figure eight, right? And you could have a whole bunch of fun just changing these numbers uh, and get different effects and different loops and, and weird things happen. Um, and that's, that's a lot of the fun for me. It's just like putting numbers in and seeing what happens. Okay, this one is, again, super important. Um, like instantly, so ATAN2, again, it's sort of like maybe an intimidating name, part tangent, and I, I don't truly know what the two means. Um, I think it's about like, I use this all the time. Does anyone? Uh, sort of. Yes. Yeah. It's a uh, it's a variation on the arc tangent function that's just a little bit more efficient. Mm -hmm. You have two oh, arguments instead of one. Yeah. yeah. Two it's arguments it's instead of one. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to do the division. So it does. So you it goes on the block generator. Okay. Yes, yes, that, I, I, I understand that a little bit. Um, but all you need to know is that if you call this function and you give it some y and x value, it's going to point, the result is going to be some angle that is pointing in that direction, right? And so often, very, very frequently, and I'll talk about something Unity has that's a little bit nicer than this, maybe. Um, but, and I pass it the, the velocity and the x, and it's really just going to look wherever it's going. Right? And like instantly, this is that same code from the slide before. Um, you know, this. Uh, and remember how I told you why we're going to have triangles, or why we have triangles? It's this. Um, and this to me is like, oh, is this thing uh, alive now? Like, yeah, I love this. This is just, again, one line of code. Um, and <coughs> a ton of character. And it's still flexible, it's still dynamic. Yeah. Um, so, Unity has this thing called look at. Um, maybe some of you are familiar with it, but it's, it's sort of, I guess, a 3D version of this. I looked, when I learned about this, I looked for an Arctan 3. I don't think, I, Unity doesn't have it. it. I think it probably exists, but I don't know. You don't need to worry about it, especially if you're in Unity, because uh, there's look at, and it kind of does the same thing. It does it a little bit better, um, but you can see all of them, right? Uh, all I said was, this code is on each of these cones, uh, and this is the target transform, right? So this is that thing moving uh, cosine-wise. Um, and you could hide that, right? And then all of a sudden, you've got this weird animation of these teeth that are moving around or something. Um, and that's really interesting. I just put this ball here so you knew what it was looking at. Um, but again, this is another really important thing. Getting things to look at other things is really, really important. Um, you know, it, it shows you the direction that it's moving, right? If I took a freeze frame of this, you would know where it was headed. Um, but also, it tells you like, hey, this is really important, right? If you really want something, someone to pay attention to a certain element in your game, have other things look at it. Um, and then every time, every, you know, again, if I pause this, every arrow on this thing is pointing to the thing I want you to look at. Um, all right, so that was sort of that thing. Uh, I'm going to talk about noise now. Um, I think a lot of people probably know or have heard of what noise is. Um, and the place where I first learned about it was with procedurally generated terrain, so like a static thing. Um, and I sort of thought that's all it was. And, and I'll explain a little bit what noise is. Um, yeah, um, I'll show you. So okay, let's say you wanted something to move around, right? And you kind of didn't care, you wanted some kind of random movement. So naively, you're like, I know, I'll, I'll just use random numbers. Uh, Unity's got these really great functions. Uh, inside unit sphere and inside unit circle. 
But really, it's just I'm saying, give me a random position, right? And you end up with this, and that's not helpful. Um, maybe it is. Maybe this is really interesting for a thing like you're making. Um, oftentimes, though, this is not what I want. Uh, and so that's just random numbers, right? That's totally random coin tosses, whatever. Um, at least as good as computers can do. Uh, and so you might think like, oh, okay, I could do a little bit better. Um, oh no, this is supposed to be a plus sign. Sorry. Um, instead, you're like, okay, I'm gonna move the thing by some random amount, just a little bit, every frame. And that's, that's maybe a little bit better, like they're a little bit more cohesive. Uh, they're freaking out. Um, and that doesn't need to happen, but not that helpful, right? Um, instead, noise. Right, um, so these things, you might be familiar with like lerp or some kind of like easing or cleaning, right? You don't need to do that. Um, well, you can, it's, it's got its own benefits, but using noise, um, and the thing about noise is that it's smooth, uh, and I'll talk about that in a second, but it's, it's predictable, it's smooth, and like as you go from one value, remember how we did the sine and cosine thing, where I had some you know, sine function cosine, and then the elapsed time. Um, this is like that, um, but it's gonna be random, right? It's not super predictable, uh, but it's smooth, right? So like, if, uh, if elapsed time is zero, you're gonna have one position, and if elapsed time is one, it's gonna be a little bit different from what it was at zero, but it's not gonna be totally different, right? Um, and so that's really useful for stuff like terrain generation where you want like mountains that are gradual, right? So you can kind of think about that. But if you assign it to position, you get this kind of interesting smooth movement. Um, and we'll see this, uh, well, I don't see Chris, but Chris and Colin know what this is. Um, yeah, and then I'm doing that thing where they're walking where they're headed, right? And you get these interesting things, just kind of moving around, and again, just a couple lines of code. There's that one other line, the Arctan code. But like, this is a really interesting effect to me, maybe not to everyone, but I think there's just a lot you can do here. And you can change how quickly they're moving by changing the elapsed time, how fast the elapsed time is counting up. You can multiply, you can add, you can use special values, you can do a cosine in here and really get crazy. Um, so again, flexible, dynamic, really nice. Okay, um, so we're gonna take a break from that for a second. We're gonna talk about LARPing. Um, this is maybe one of the first things I learned about in Unity. Um, and it's kind of a weird word. Um, and I kind of just like was like, well, uh, I want my camera to follow this thing. All this, the code says use LARP, and I kind of did it. Um, and I didn't really understand what it was doing. I had a really a misconception about what it was doing, and it's really like a super useful thing, um, and we'll talk about it. Uh, so the general idea is LERP is short for interpolation. Again, don't worry about that word. Um, but basically it says, okay, you're gonna give it some lower value, let's say, and some upper value, and then tell me how, how much between it you want to be, right? And so if you give it a zero, a one, and you want to be, let's say, 25% between it, that would be 0.25, right? Follow me? Um, so same here, right? Give me 75% of the way there, I get 75. Wait, I should be doing this. Um, and so like if we change the upper bound, instead of being one, but we still want to be 25% of the way there, it's going to be 25, right? Because that's 25% of the way between zero and um, likewise, you know, same thing. Um, and then, you know, obviously your, your numbers aren't going to look like this. Maybe they will sometimes. Um, but it could be anything. Uh, right? And it will still, this is 42% of the way between negative 427 and 980 is this number right here. Um, and what's interesting, this is bonus, um, right, is that you can actually go beyond bounds, and this could also be a negative number. Um, so what's the big deal? 
Uh, so vector lerping, right? Like what I just showed you was just sort of regular numbers, uh, but the same concept, like hold that concept in your brain um, and, and apply it to positions in space, right? And so this thing is going to constantly lerp towards the sphere, right? And what happens when you do that over time is it goes 10% of the way there. Every frame, it's going to go 10% of the way there. And there's other ways to do the same thing, but this is the learned way to do it. Um, and this has some problems, but just if you know what those problems are, don't worry about it. Um, right? It's just going to go 10% of the way there all the time. And it gives you this sort of nice, smooth movement. Again, we have to look at is why not. Um, yeah, and this is super useful. Uh, again, something I use all the time. It's great for just like adding like a really quick easing um, if you don't want to think too hard about it. Uh, if you want, you know, smooth following, I think I probably I said this already, but like a camera follow is my like bare bones camera script every time. It's just like look at my thing um, and then, you know, lerp to its position. And you get smooth movement. Um, so I didn't know, remember I was talking about uh, how useful LERP is, I didn't know for a long time that it applied to pretty much everything, right? Like position is one thing and scale is another one, rotation is another one. Rotation gets a little weird, but whatever. Um, but it's also really, really nice for color. Um, so this is where we get into sort of combining things. Uh, and remember that state plus state equals state, that's this. Okay, so what's going on here? So remember above, right? We're, we're sort of interpolating, going between uh, two values. This time we're interpolating between two values, red and blue, right? Um, and we're going to say uh, that it's going to be some variable number, right? Some, and it's going to be an x position, right? So as things come this way, they're going to be closer to this red value. And as things go this way, they're going to be closer to their blue value. Right? Does that make sense? Um, and then this is this is not really part of it, but you should know about how to do this. I, I don't think this is the best way to do this, but it was fast. <laughs> right? It's pretty sweet. Uh, okay, some other alerts. I said this already, this can camera follow. Uh, so I'm mostly talking about um, procedural animation, but a lot of this stuff can be applied in some way to like a static image, right? Um, and oftentimes I'll, I'll have some character or some object, I want a darker version or a lighter version, um, but I don't want to have to go through the trouble of like hard coding a lighter color. So what I'll do is I'll say, okay, give me the target color, but interpolate it with white about 10% of the way, right? And that gives me a lighter version of that color. Um, and I use that a lot. That's great for like outlining a thing, but you don't want the outline to be black. Um, you want it to be a darker version of that color. And you can have all kinds of fun with, with that. Um, number picking. Uh, so again, uh, you can get Let's say you had some kind of reward system, uh, or like a treasure chest, and you wanted to pick from a list of objects, right? Um, you could just roll the dice a random number, but you could also maybe pick a number that is somewhere between zero and one, um, and then based on that, you know, interpolate between zero and the number of elements and possibilities in the treasure chest. And the better your roll, you're going to get deeper into the treasure chest and maybe get more or something, right? So like intelligent number picking. Um, not having to do with animation or anything. Uh, one of the things that's other frameworks, and I'm sure Unity has a solution, but Bezier curves, um, you can get, uh, I'm going to show an example of this later, uh, but you can get some really interesting movement uh, along a curve. And the way you do that is you define your curve and then you can sort of interpolate along that curve, and I'll, I'll show you what that looks like later. Um, but yeah.
Uh, okay, uh, dot products. Another thing that I learned at Bug Talk, um, Zyba's uh, Matt Talk. Zyba's not here. Okay. Um, so dot product. This is another thing I I don't. I was a theater major. Um, I don't. <laughs> I kind of know what's happening. I probably couldn't do this function, right? Um, but the way I think about this is how like. <clears throat> How parallel are two things, right? So, uh, if I'm pointing this way, and I, I'm, you know, also I have two vectors, and they're both pointing this way, the dot product, the, the result of the dot function is going to be one, right? And so that means they're very parallel. Uh, and I guess this would be negative one, and this would be zero. I might be a little bit wrong about that. No, you're right. Math guys, yeah. sort of. You're good. Good, right. Um, um, so it, it's a little hard to tell, but like, um, so I'm basically checking uh, its sort of orientation against the direction that it's moving. And so like, yeah, uh, so as this is going up, it, it like knows to put its wings down. And if it was going the other way, it would sort of know to put its wings up, right? Again, just like one line of code, and these things really look like they're floating around. Um, you know, it's not perfect, but it, again, it's dynamic, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> uh, And this is work that FableVision is doing with Concrete Consortium. Uh, it's a really cool project, but uh, you can talk to me about it later. Uh, camera Shake, uh, this, you know, the juice it or lose it. Um, So this one's a little more involved. Um, and really, the point of, of this one is coroutines. There's kind of a lot going on. I'm doing a random number thing. There are better ways to pick where it's going to go. Um, but we'll talk about this in pieces. Um, so the first piece is I enumerator and coroutines. These are really, really important. Um, I so turn that off early on, but I really, like, they solve a lot of problems really elegantly. Um, and it's it's sort of a, a poor person's thread. So you can kind of start a function, start a thing, um, and it will run over time sort of separately from your update loop, right? And, and that might not sound that great, but once you start using it, you're really going to like it. Um, and basically what happens is this is the important line. So there's some loop, right? And every time yield, let's just say yield, um, happens, it's kind of going to go back to the rest of the app. And it's going to do its thing. And then on the next update, it's going to come back here. And it's going to be like, OK, this is where I left off. It's going to go back here again, right? So this loop is happening over time. There's a lot of interesting ways that you can yield. You can wait for a certain amount of time. Um, yeah. Um, Basically, what's happening is I call this function and I pass in some intensity. Right again, this is the nice thing; it's the dynamic thing. So um, it could be a really intense shape, or it could be a, a, a mild shape. Um, and while the intensity is bigger than zero, I, I sort of just randomly offset the camera, and then I lower the intensity. Right, and then so it's going to kind of start off big and then gradually get smaller. Questions about that? I feel like. Elliot. Okay. Um, I'll just point out that Unity 2017.3 on disable, you have to kill your code team to crash on iOS. That's <laughs> 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 interesting. So, do you have to do that by saying stop? Stop coroutines? Stop the specific one or stop all? That's like a pretty feature. <laughs> um, excellent. So what that means is these coroutines, as they're happening, they kind of stick around. And I guess if you quit your application without getting rid of them, bad things will happen. Or if you s switch to a new scene. A new scene. Or something that you're leaving it behind. Sure. So it's probably still around and it's forgotten and now it's like trying to do stuff to stuff that doesn't exist. So. So when you do this, if you called shake, if you said start coroutine shake, you would get back some object, and then you could 
tell it to stop later. There's other ways to stop it, but you have sort of an object. And that's one of the really nice things about coroutines. I think I'll talk about it later, is that you can manipulate them sort of after the fact, and you can wait for them to be done. Um, so if you have like a, a web request and you don't know how long it's going to take, you would make it a coroutine. Um, and then you could say like, when this thing is done, um, do some other thing, right? Um, uh, okay, I told you I was going to talk about tweens. This is not, a lot of you probably know what tweens are. Um, if you came from Flash or if you've ever used any other sort of graphics thing, tweens have a lot. For whatever reason, Unity doesn't have like a tween thing built in. Um, and that's fine. I went for a long time without ever using tweens. I was like, oh, these are actually really nice and powerful. Um, so don't think like them just because Unity doesn't have them. Uh, they're really nice. Uh, they can do some things that it's really hard to do in other ways. Um, so like I was saying, Unity doesn't have this built in. Um, so you'll have to get a library. Um, this is a good free one that I like. Uh, this one, I don't think it's free. Right, does anyone know? No. It, I don't think it's free, free, but it's version. nice. There's a free version, but you, there's also a paid version that has stuff that integrates with other third party assets. Cool. Um, and if you're ever uh, doing JavaScript development, which I do a lot of JavaScript development as well, uh, GreenSock is amazing. Uh, and it's another tweaking library, but it's not usable in Unity. <clears throat> and so the general idea with tweens is uh, you kind of start at some position. And this could be a color, this could be a size, this could be just a number and some end value. And then you're going to tell it how long it takes to go between those two values. And then you're going to give it an easing function. I'll talk about that in a second. And then you, you've kind of got this thing, and you can tell it to start. And then whatever thing this is on will go from this to this. It will take this long to do it, and it will do this thing. And I'll show you that in the next slide, I think. Does that make sense? So this is one of the really cool things about tweens, is you can sort of describe how it's going to get there. Um, let's see, where, is there a linear on here? I don't see a linear, well, the orange line. So like if you just sort of, you know, I'm going to move from here to here, and it's going to take me one second, it would just sort of be moving at a constant speed. Um, but that's not super natural. Uh, it's not very natural. <laughs> um, and so you might have something like, the sort of classic is sort of like an ease out. So like if, I would, if you were driving a car, right, you don't just like go somewhere and then stop instantly. You gradually slow down over time. Um, and that's, in a lot of tweeting libraries, that's sort of the default. But there's all these like interesting easing functions. Uh, most libraries come with them. You can write your own. Um, you can get pretty crazy with it, uh, and you get some interesting effects. You can have things bounce or give the appearance of bouncing. They can kind of move randomly. Uh, uh, yeah, easing. Um, pretty cool. Uh, somewhere, so is that gift somewhere available online? Because the curve corresponding to the movements is very interesting. Yeah. Uh, so this talk will be available, um, but this, yeah, yeah. Uh, this, this, someone wrote, so this isn't, as far as I can tell, a tweening library, but they just made this visualization, mm -hmm. uh, and it's super cool. Uh, and it shows, like, you can look up, there's a ton of places where you can get easing functions, and they'll show you. This was the only one I found that showed all of them at the same time. I think it's nice. Um, and it won't be in pixelated. All right, thank you. Sure. Um, so I don't know what the non-JavaScript or, I don't know, I call them callbacks uh, because I do a lot of JavaScript development. Um, and what you can do is there are times in the sort of life cycle of a tween, special moments, um, and you can listen for those moments, and you can do something on those moments, right? And so you might call a tween, you might start it, you might say it's going to take 
two seconds. Um, and that's sort of easy enough, and you could just sort of wait two seconds to do a thing. Or if you didn't really know how long it was going to take, you could just wait until it was done. And then you could call some function after it. And that's really nice. Uh, that's sort of also true of coroutines. Um, but in addition to on complete, there's also on start or on progress. So like every time it changes, do a thing, right? Um, and you could group. You could you could do something like you could have five tweens, and when they're all done, do a thing, right? And that's really useful. Um, okay. Uh, was there anything else I wanted to say about tweens? Any questions about tweens? Use them. Um, get a library that you're familiar with. They're helpful. Um, okay, skeletal animation. This is the other topic that I, I do this stuff a lot, and it's it's really changed the way we do stuff at Babel Vision to some degree. Um, and it's really really useful. I'm going to talk about spine viewing. So if you've ever done 3D animation, you kind of already know what this is. Um, but it's, for whatever reason, it's kind of easier to wrap my head around what's happening in 2D. The spine is a really, really great 2D skeletal animation system. Uh, we use it a lot. Uh, it's, it's cheap for like independent development. It can get really expensive, I think. Uh, but it's really powerful and really nice. And I'm going to show you some examples in a little bit. Uh, but it's a 2D skeletal animation system. Um, yeah, perfect. Okay, uh, so here's, here's a 2D character. Um, a couple of things I want you to notice, there's that blink, I remember I was telling you about that? Uh, that's important. Um, a couple of things, so this is one set of art, right? There's, there's a couple of, there's like a light piece, another light piece, there's a belly piece, hands, arms, face, the eyes kind of do a special thing uh, where they have a blink and that's sort of a separate piece of art. Uh, but it's really just one flat atlas of art, right? Um, and it's code driven, right? So spine, you kind of animate this thing in this other application. Um, how are we doing on time? Good. Uh, and, and then you get back this file that describes all these motions using code that you don't have to worry about. Um, yeah, and so a couple of things that are really cool about this, um, all of these are separate animations, like there's the idle, um, there's the listening, right? Um, and then there's probably like a talking, yeah, and it's like, hey, you did a good job. Um, and you'll notice, even though they're totally separate animations, they smoothly go to each other, right? And that's that's because of this sort of combinable, flexible thing that I've been talking about. Um, is that it knows, like, it's like, okay, well, my code is telling me that I should be doing this right now, and then it's telling me I should be doing this right now. It knows how to get there, right? And if this was just frame-based animation, you would, you would see that cut, right? You would see it jump, and that can be kind of jarring. Um, and then so sort of another thing, remember, uh, so this is pretty cool. Um, so I just changed some stuff, and it, it didn't stop rendering or anything like that. Um, it, I just sort of changed the pieces that were on top of the skeleton, right? So it's still animating, doing the same exact animation, and the animator uh, only had to animate it that one time, and that's really nice. That saves a ton of time. There's you know more set up at the beginning, um, but then it pays off really pretty well. Um, and you can do things, you know, like these kind of character presentation. Remember I was talking about that color interpolation? You can see it in action right there. Um, so, you know, instead of being pink with a black outline, it's pink with a magenta, like a dark pink that's interpolated between pink and black. I may be more intelligent than did that. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so that's the skeletal animation thing. Um, so yeah, remember I talked about combining and blending animations. Uh, that um, the attachments and skins. Uh, okay, and then so Unity, uh, the, the sort of solution for Unity, um, it's 
I'm trying to think of how to describe this. Unity has uh, a way of describing how to go from one animation to another and how to do things with, you know, like how to say it's time to do the walk cycle. If the character is pressing up or down, start walking, right? And that's all mechanism. And I'm not going to go too deeply into that at all. It's a really big topic. Uh, it's intimidating at first, but it's not that bad. Um, and it's really powerful. Um, yeah. Um, Um, and so, just to kind of show you some of its power, remember that blend, the, sorry, the dot product that I was talking about? Uh, so when I, I did this, I was so excited uh, that I, I felt really smart. Um, but basically, so say you've got a character that can walk in all, all sorts of different directions, um, 3D character, um, and they've got a walk forward cycle, they've got a walk backward cycle, and they've got strafe left and strafe right. Um, if you're in 3D and you're trying to get between certain movements, you're going to see that jerk or that, that cut between the animations. Um, but if you use the dot product and you use a blend tree, so these are kind of just keywords that I'm going to tell you about and not really explain because they're too big. Um, but if you sort of combine those, you can tell Unity to blend. Like if I'm walking forward and a little bit to the like, side, it will blend the, the forward walk and the strafe, and it will look really pretty natural. Um, and that's how you get these really complicated movements in 3D animation. The same applies for 2D animation as well. Um, so this is really cool, and this is like a lot of stuff that I'm not going to talk about, but blend trees are a really nice feature of Mechanin, uh, and you can use that dot rock we were talking about, and that's exciting. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, So remember, this is going back, this is kind of the, the fun part. Um, you're going back to that idea of taking some state and applying it to some other state. Um, and this is, I've basically taken some audio state, you know, the state of the audio at any given time, and I'm applying to the scale of these cubes. And you get like a really sweet music visualizer. There's a lot of fun things you can do with this. This is sort of the simplest. Um, and I have this crazy idea, and it should hopefully show like how weird you can get with just sort of this simple idea. Um, <laughs> this, um, so remember, I was talking about those blend trees. This isn't. I, I, have, I have bigger plans for this, but uh, yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, any questions right now? What kind of bigger ideas do you have? So well, right now it's interpolating between two animations. There's sort of like a squat animation um, and a standing animation. And they're not really animations either, they're just poses. Um, but I think you know each each row of dancers should have its own animation that they're doing. Um, I don't know, we'll see. Uh, a, a lot of the fun for this um, is it's just like doing weird stuff. Uh, and then changing it and seeing what happens, and then you know I might throw some cosine functions and some arctans in there and, and get some crazy results yeah, out of it. You can have like a you can have like a cosine function or something that causes them to go through waves in the depth. Beautiful, I'm doing that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you can totally have a cosine function and they would totally wave, and it would be really cool. Um, yeah, great. So that's exactly it. Um, that's sort of the big idea. Uh, we have 10 minutes, I guess, um, and I'll show just some of the things that I was talking about. Uh, so we're going to talk about this. Um, so here's just kind of an example. This is that kind of consortium thing. Um, everything here is animated with code. Um, this is work in progress, so you know. Uh, but like, see how they're moving, right? Um, these are proteins in your body, uh, and this is to some degree really happening inside all of us right now. Um, and these are melanosomes, right? And these, these things, I forget what they're called, but their job is to carry them 
uh, to some other part of the body, or they get distributed in your skin and give you pigment. I, I don't know. Um, and they walk, right? Um, and depending, there's, what's interesting that's not being shown here is that like, depending on the size of their feet, really, uh, like they would move faster or slower. Um, and again, that's all dynamic, right? Because of the way they're moving, they're actually really moving. Um, and it might look interesting, but really this is a sine wave, um, but it's an absolute value of a sine wave, right? So that's how it, it goes like this. Um, and then, you know, I was talking about that dynamic thing. See how their tails kind of grab on? That's sort of important to this, this thing, and they need it to be dynamic so that they could function that way, and they could kind of grab from anywhere. Um, you know, if I let go, this green one now grabbed it, right? Um, and we have another, you know, This is another part of the body you can kind of notice stuff. So again, all code driven. Um, the size in this in this case, the size of their mouths is important. Um, and broken ones will have a bigger mouth, right? And they build these stars. Um, and again, this could all be dynamic. So if the cell's working properly, they'll build these stars. Properly is kind of not the right word, um, but otherwise they won't. And these stars will start to break apart. And this can all be dynamic, right? Like we can change just a couple of values and you get bigger stars and, and, and all sorts of things like that. We have another one, but uh, I'll sort of skip it. Um, and then here's just an example. Remember I was saying that looking at another game that if you want to fund, you can talk to me after this. Uh, but you see uh, their eyes. Um, oh. um, so see the eyes of this character? They're both looking at her, or him, I'm not totally sure yet, um, right? And so it's just like a little thing, it tells the player this is really important, um, and it's just cute, it just gives them a life that like, if this was static art, would feel much more like developer art. Uh, but just that little art tan two, one function call, they're, they're doing a little thing, you know? Yeah, um, okay, uh, general tips and tricks, I'll go through this fast. Uh, so I do a lot of stuff with just solid white art, and then I tint it. Uh, that gives me a lot of flexibility. Um, and it, it looks better. Um, like, stuff will sort of always work. Uh, if you have a bunch of art from a bunch of different places and a bunch of different color palettes, it's going to feel bad, and you might not know why. If you do it this way, you'll never have that problem. Well, um, this is not about animation, but uh, hue, saturation, value, or these are Two of these are the same, and one of them is different. Um, don't use RGB to pick your colors. This is sort of the human way to pick colors. This is hue, saturation, and value. So this is like what color, red, orange, yellow, green, blue. Uh, saturation is sort of how intense that color is. And value is how bright or how close to white or close to black. Um, and that's just intuitively a much easier way to understand. Uh, and if you just sort of pick colors with the RGB color picker, you're going to pick colors wrong. Use the H HSV color pickers, um, and then just change the saturation of value. You know, only change one of those things, and you'll get colors that work together a lot better. Um, uh, yeah, I do this a lot. Uh, you know, if you're looping through something, uh, just just uh, use I, and then that will offset things. Uh, uh, combine multiple states. So I talked about this a little bit. Um, you know, I was using noise plus color, and we got that blue radiant motion thing. Uh, yeah, you get those dancers. Um, blurb is not just for motion. I already talked about that. Uh, this is another thing. Um, it's just I felt this was important. Um, a lot of times when I was early on, I would sort of have some art, and I would put my scripts on that art. Um, and things get weird and bad. If you put the art as a child of the object that has all your scripts on it, it gives you a lot more freedom and it kind of lets you sort of pivot that art in a way and it, just in general, just do this. <laughs> Believe me. Uh, okay, uh, oh, these are two slides together. Um, better random. Uh, so I talked a little bit about Perlman noise. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of different kinds of random that you might not know about. This is the one we all think of, uniform distribution. 
But then there's Gaul. Galaxy. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, and look at that. That's like kind of more in the center. Uh, and that's sort of more organic. That's really more how things happen in reality. Um, and then there's power law distribution, right? Um, which get you know, interesting things. Uh, this guy, Tyler Hobbs, really interesting guy. More static art, but um, a lot of good stuff. Yeah, uh, use coroutines, I talked about this. Uh, okay, oh man, oh no. Oh, my slides are all messed up. Uh, the resources will be available. Uh, the most important one, too, juice it or lose it, we already talked about that. And then Keith Peters, Keith Peters, are you here tonight? No, he, I know he's local, and he, he was one of the authors of that book. Um, he does this uh, YouTube series called, um, Programming math or something. Um, he's like 90% of the way, or the reason that I do this kind of stuff. He has a YouTube series that is really approachable and really great. Um, yeah, and he's local. And he did. He had a site back in the day. It still exists, but it's different. Called Bit 101. Um, and just to show you, I think that's his Twitter tag too. Yeah. Um, but like back in the day of Macromedia Flash. Um, this guy was huge towards my development. So while I'm pulling some examples <laughs> up, do we have any questions? Yeah. Um, do you ever find that um, using uh, procedural animation gets you um, worse performance than using a cached animation? Absolutely. That's a really great point. Um, so, I mean, they're trade-offs. Um, it's, that's absolutely true, right? Like, instead of it just sort of looking at a picture and showing you a part of that picture, that's sort of the frame-based way of animating, um, which is a really sort of dumb operation. Not dumb, but just like really quick. Um, it, it performs really fast. And instead, if you're doing all this math, right, it's got to do that all the time, and maybe it's got to do that for hundreds of things. What I'll say is, like, computers are shockingly fast, uh, especially at math. Um, and if you're careful, you can get away with a lot of stuff, right? Like this, um, you know, right? Like this is running in a browser, this is JavaScript actually. Um, and it doesn't run great on probably some older devices, maybe on some phones, but I mean, it's okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, use your best judgment, there's trade offs. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I mean, you just couldn't do this with frame-based animation, um, but file size, right? Like, yes. so I just have triangles, circles, and that might be it for this. Um, yeah, so file size is an optimization, but that's also not that important to optimize for these days. Um, yeah, any other questions? Uh, can you just uh, go over briefly like what that curly noise function does that you use? Sure. Um, let me Google it. Because uh, the picture, I feel like, will really do a better job. Right. So, okay. Um, so, what's happening here um, is at every pixel in this square, we're saying, okay, call the Perlin noise function and give it its x and y value. And it's going to return some number between 0 and 1, let's say. If it gives me a 0, it's going to be black. And if it gives me uh, a 1, it's going to be white. Right? And you'll notice how it's very smoothly transitioning. Um, and the alternative to this would be like uh, the noise on your TV, which is totally just random and looks like garbage. This is actually sort of cohesive. Um, and can, you can kind of make some sense of this. Um, and so like, you can almost see like, how this could be terrain. right? Like These white parts could be peaks. Um, and, and what you can do, and this kind of doesn't look that interesting, but what you can do is you can layer. Remember I was talking about combining things? So you can layer, you could sort of take like a really broad version of this, um, like really blow this way up, and then also add in sort of a smaller version of this, and you'll get sort of like really big mountains, uh, but then on the mountain there are these small little peaks and valleys, and that's where stuff gets interesting in terrain generation. 
So okay, so that's that's sort of the visual representation. So now imagine if instead uh, we were just took like one slice of this, um, and we were just passing in the time value. So over time, right? So if instead of x we were passing in time, uh, you would get a similar thing where a s things are sort of smoothly moving over time, and that's what you saw in in the slide. Did that help? Yeah. Um, yeah, and so you can, yeah, um, in, in my case, uh, um, sure, so that's all that's happening. Cool. Right, so I, instead of passing it an X and a Y, uh, I'm just using elapsed time. Uh, I'm also doing some other stuff behind the scenes uh, to sort of uh, decrease the rate at which this changes, so it's a little bit smoother. But that's all. It's all that's happening. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, to give some more, you gave a lot of great examples of what to apply this into. Are there like, what are a few suggestions you would give for sort of? Assets in Unity or properties of things that you might want to dynamically animate. Sure. Uh, great. Um, so yeah, obviously position is is great one, pretty obvious. Uh, scale, uh, rotation, those are all super interesting things. And just with that, you can go really, really far. Um, color, another one. Uh, but then, so those dancers, right? Like, if you have a character animation you can sort of interpolate between like a jump and a walk and get sort of a more natural jump and walk. Um, and you might have like a walk cycle and a run cycle. And so you would, instead of just saying, okay, if, if my speed is one walk, if my speed is greater than five run, you could actually have, you know, give, put my speed into some function and then blend between the walk and the run so you could just naturally have a jog. Um, so that's that blending stuff that I was talking about with Mechanin. Google that stuff. It's intimidating, but it's really not, and it's really, really powerful. Um, let's see. Yeah, and then just like character attributes, right? Like the way things are, their, their speed, their, anything that is specific to your game, uh, the amount of damage that is done could be based on the velocity of the projectile. Um, those types of things. So take one part of your game, put it into another part of your game, and, and see what happens. And as the bullet is going really fast, change its color so that you know that it's really powerful, etc. Uh, I'll just sort of add some little anecdotes to why you should really use this stuff a lot. Um, so if you think about something like people um, obviously play Overwatch, um, there was one point where they um, long range accuracy. And the way you can express that in a game is by one of these uh, low perfusion functions. You can say, okay, uh, the accuracy percentage is some function over time or over distance. Um, and if you want to you know, tweak how the, the, the behavior of that gun works, all you have to do is you know, change that function. So uh, there's a lot of applications for this also in design as well. This is also something that a lot of uh, AI code uses too. So something like a um, uh, vision cone might have some noise applied to it, or some, you know, like aggro range might be some function over distance, you know, this, this sort of stuff. So it's definitely like animation is a really great use of this, but it's like a super, super, super useful tool. Everywhere. Yeah. Okay. And I guess I would add too, from like the artistic standpoint, not the code standpoint for this stuff. Um, like if you're working on any kind of materials in Unity or anything that's using custom shaders, like all you're going to be doing all day is animating the noise and changing parameters and things like that. And you can export all those um, settings back out and make them exposable in Unity. And then you can use this kind of code to tweak all that stuff too. So that's you know, more on the art side. But totally. Yeah. Great point. Yeah. Would you recommend against using Unity's built-in animation tools, or could those be combined with these techniques? Yeah, so that's sort of a weird question. Like, Unity has always had these animation tools that don't, that aren't supported, right? Or like are being phased out. So there's Mechanin. 
I totally recommend using that. But then there's the ability to like actually create your animations in Unity. I've used them, uh, they're passable. I think there are way better tools for animating. I'm not an animator. Um, but that, I mean, do you know what the deal is? It's weird, like it's, it exists, but I think in, it's gotten a little bit more robust in certain areas, like the cinema machine, like animating cameras, hmm. um, and some of the timeline stuff, but their typical animated component has a Yes. It's one of the oldest things in Unity. Um, just as one data point, like uh, we're working on Mark Bear 2, uh, and we, like, every animation in the entire game is. I don't cool. think it has any of that stuff. Maybe it does. Um, That's a little bit. I haven't been able to play around with it. An example of um, a tutorial system that was, um, you know, you, you want to highlight something on the screen to the player, you could sort of big, big giant, giant arrow pointing at it, but actually one of the devs just added a small bump to make it a bit bigger and pulse. And it just immediately, your eyes are drawn to it. You don't need a big flash on the outside of it. You've already got the existing element. You just animate it ever so slightly to give it a bit of a kick. Yeah, absolutely. I do that all the time. I set the scale of the object to be sign of time, and now it's pulsing. And that is way better than a new arrow. Totally agree. Um, and one thing you said sort of reminded me, so like difficulty is probably a really easy way to do this, right? Like you were talking about like you have enemies that have a sight line and you want to make the difficulty harder and you just increase that sight line and now it's harder. Um, sort of a poor, simple example, but that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Other questions? So is there, uh, thank you for talk, by the way, Matt. So is there any mathematical equation that we could use to animate facial expression or for rigging? Because that's also a big part in the animation. And I heard that uh, rigging is really time consuming. Yeah. So I, I imagine that if for this kind of mathematic equation to deal with the rigging, maybe that's what it's really helpful. Uh, so there are probably really smart people working on these kinds of things. I'm not that smart. Mm -hmm. um, what I would say, if I was going to try and tackle something to make it at all do something like that, um, I probably still wouldn't do the rigging part with code, but I might rig it um, and then somehow get a hold of those joints or those pieces of the ring, and then I might try and do something based on the vowel sounds coming out of their mouth. And, and there are some ways um, you can there are libraries that will let you take, uh, sort of take apart speech and break them into vowel sounds, mm -hmm. and then give you sort of a value, and you can sort of determine what mouth shape to make based on that vowel sound. Um, so that sort of a thing, you know, um, I don't know. Just as I'm curious. Yeah, I'm. I'm sure there are a lot of people who have solved that. Like I've seen some interesting things where you can like map your facial expressions onto someone else's face, and it's really scary and convincing. Um, so people are doing that stuff, and, but I, I'm not in, in Unity specifically, there's a couple plugins that go into some open source speech recognition software that can drive either bone animations or blend shapes, which are sort of individual meshes with different shapes, and then you would use animation to blend between vertex positions. Is it like in research phase or is it in production already? There's stuff in production but still being researched. I mean, it's, if you have a lot of money, you can get certain things and mm -hmm. there's like, oh, like PhD dissertations. But is there any animation company that are using this technology to make their animations? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's a plugin. I, the name escapes me, but there is a free plugin that will, I think it's free, that will do. Uh, do that like you know, animation based on speech uh, audio. Um, it's not great, but mm -hmm. it works. Um, and it's not something that's really well developed in the industry, I'd say. Like, you know, I think Oculus even has one of their own. Okay. You know, I, I know that the uh, Dragon Age Origins toolkit back in the day, you could type in this some character's dialogue and it had a little engine in it that would do text-to-speech and then animate the face. <laughs> Nothing looks really natural. Yeah. No, but something. Any other questions?
I just, uh, real quickly, you said you were going to post the uh, presentation. Is that just going to be on the Meetup site? Or? Uh, yeah, great. Um, so there will be a link here, but it will be uh, at Add it to like um, comments or discussion. Um, sure, I'll add the, the link to the meetup site um, once I fix how, whatever I did to break down the slide. <laughs> <laughs> to post it to the uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Anything else? Thank you for having me.